one, yeah. So that one right there. Uh, oh, there's another one. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Hmm. uh oh, oh. <laughs> hi. Um... <laughs> You're probably wondering what this has to do with mass spectrometry, by the way. There's the differences. I think there's only three. Um, well, yeah, it, it actually has a lot to do with mass spectrometry. When you're looking at spectra like this, and they look to be identical. In fact, there's a lot of differences between them. They might be subtle, but they are not the same. These two, two spectra, they're actually for two completely different molecules. So we talked about isotopes in a previous video. Today we're going to talk about mass accuracy. So small shifts in the mass that make a big difference in reporting what a compound might be. So when it all comes down to it, what is a mass spectrometer anyways? Well, it's it's just a scale. It's a balance. It's something that weighs molecules. Well, actually, it's, it's not at all. But I mean, let's just take that analogy just for a second. So I'm going to ask the question, how much do I weigh? And how am I going to figure that out? Well, we're going to do what we always do. We step on the bathroom scale. So let's just check it out here. By the way, don't laugh. I'm not a big guy. Um, we'll see where this comes out. I've actually gained a couple pounds recently. So yeah, there we go. 142.4 pounds. But is that what I weigh? I guess the question really comes down to, how good is my bathroom scale? Is it accurate? Does it actually give me the correct mass? So I went through the trouble of, those are a couple of uh, 30 pound weights, put them on the scale, and sure enough, they don't read correctly. They seem to be reading heavy by two pounds. So does that mean that my mass is actually off by two pounds? Is that the right way to do it? You know, taking off the two? Maybe. Uh, but then again, there is a different way to think about this because as a percentage or as a fraction, that difference two pounds out of 60 pounds corresponds to 3.3%. So I could do the calculation here and I could subtract or do a ratio with my mass as well and come up with a new number. But that's still a question mark. I mean, it, it really depends if the calibration down at the low end is kind of holding consistent up to my mass, or even if it's linear across the range. Look, this video is not actually gonna talk about how to calibrate masses, but I'll just throw this in just for fun. I happen to try this again at another point. Here's uh, the two 30 pounds and another 25 that you don't actually see. Should be 85 pounds and it's off again. Uh, and in fact, it's not even off by the same percentage that it was. But like I said, that's, that doesn't matter. It's not important right now. The point is that when you're thinking about weighing something, there is error associated with that weighing. So let's bring the problem back down to mass spectrometry. And we're going to use our example from the last video. So this is bovine insulin chain B. And since we know what the compound is, we know exactly what the formula is, which means we can calculate exactly what the monoisotopic mass corresponds to. Remember that definition, it means it's the lowest mass on the scale. So let's just kind of zoom in on this. I'm interested to see actually what we did read in this particular spec. And now that we can zoom in on these peaks and take a look at what that mass might be, well, it's not bad but it isn't perfect. It's not exactly the same number. And that's completely what we would expect to be. The mass spectrometer has error associated with it. So when it comes to expressing the error, what we're going to do is that same ratio that we did with my bathroom scale. So rather than just express the absolute difference, we're going to do that as a ratio or as a, as a percentage of, of the mass that we should see. So the formula for mass accuracy is the observed take away the expected divided by the expected value. Now actually, it really doesn't matter whether you're using observed or expected because those numbers are so close to each other. I mean, just try it. Plug both, plug both numbers into the equation. You'll see it pops out to be pretty much the same number. So when we do the math down here, this number comes out to be very, very small. And just as we do with fractions, when we multiply by 100 to put it as a percentage scale, I'm just going to multiply by a bigger number here. So I'll multiply by a million, and that puts the number expressed as parts per million. So in fact, mass accuracy could be expressed in parts per million or as a percentage. You could even do it as the absolute value, but it's much more common today to express it in parts per million. Now, I know what you might be thinking now. If we have the mass accuracy, why can't we just correct our instrument. In other words, we get a reading, it's off by a certain amount, so just go ahead and 
add or subtract that number to it. You should be able to recalculate what the true mass should be. I wish it was that simple, but it's, it doesn't work out that way. So in fact, when you take a reading, let's say many, many times over, the mass can be kind of anywhere. So it could shift down or it could shift up. I mean, really, there's a range of values. If you were repeating the measurement multiple times, you'll find that the monoisotopic peak, or really all of them, will vary across the distribution. It'll move slightly depending on the mass accuracy that we see. So expressing max accuracy is more like expressing a distribution, like a Gaussian shaped peak, where it's most probable to be in the center, but it could shift out to either side. So mass accuracy is not an absolute value. It's not a correction factor that you can apply to your numbers. It's more of an uncertainty, like a degree of error that just puts a question mark on what your mass should be. Let's just do an example to kind of drive this home. Okay, so in this example here, we have a mass spectrometer and it provides us with a mass accuracy of 50 parts per million. And just pause for a second. How would you even know that the mass spectrometer provides 50 parts per million? Well, one of two ways, actually. First, usually the instrument manufacturers are going to tell you, hey, our mass spectrometers are good to 50 parts per million. Eh, it's pretty good. And the other thing that you could do is just check it out for yourself. So take a compound that you know the mass and start measuring it. You'll see that the numbers are going to vary a little bit. So back to the question. We take our unknown and we read it. And it just gives us a mass of uh, 194.0724. So, I mean, what's, what's the question? Well, the question is, what is the actual mass? What's the true mass of this unknown? Now, unfortunately, this is actually a trick question. The answer is we don't really know what the true mass is. All we can say is that the mass that we observe is somewhere in the vicinity of the true mass. So we say that there's an error of plus or minus 50 parts per million. Now, even by expressing it this way, it doesn't really give us a sense of what we're talking about. So I want to convert the 50 parts per million into an absolute value. So I'm going to take the answer, the 194, multiply it by 50 parts per million, and then divide back by a million because I want just the fraction and not the sort of percent type thing. So when we do that, we get this mass. And even one better way to do it might be to express it as a range. So now we have the high value and the low value. Does that mean that our true mass lies somewhere between these two numbers? Even now, not necessarily. What we're just saying is that most of the time, the true mass should be somewhere within that range. This is a confidence interval. And if you're not sure what a confidence interval is, I do have other videos in the other playlist that you can look through to, to get a sense of what that means. But let's just say that the true mass should be somewhere in that range. At least we hope it is. I know that's not really a satisfying answer to say that we don't know what the mass is, but that's, that's the fact of how things work. If our compound is an unknown, a mass spectrometer is just guessing. It's just giving us the best estimate of what the mass might be. So we don't know what the mass is. It is better to be able to report that mass with a smaller range that's going to give us a better hint at what this compound might be. But that's really as far as we can take it. We will talk about how we can use those masses to identify unknowns in another video. Ah, oh, now you didn't actually think we were gonna leave without me telling you what that compound might be. Well, for those of you that have been thinking and kind of staring at other videos that I've posted, you'll notice that there was a compound that actually fit within that mass range. And that molecule just happens to be this one right here. This is caffeine and there's its mass. So the mass happens to fit right in between the range that we've provided for our unknown. So it fits. Is it caffeine? Okay, well, actually we still don't know. The mass can be within the range, so the compound could be caffeine. Now, in actual fact, we don't have enough information right now. When it comes to identifying compounds, we're gonna use all the information that we can pull out of mass spectrometry. That includes not only the mass, but the isotopes as well. So that's something that we're going to talk about in a later video. All right, thanks for watching.